I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon's uh, presenter, Professor Dal Myers. Uh, he's a professor of policy planning and demography uh, and director of the Population Dynamics Research Group at the Saul Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Uh, he is, like many of the scholars of social science and policy forum has been bringing in, uh, is someone who is interdisciplinary. He's a demographer and urban planner who integrates quantitative evidence with interpretations of problems and policy solutions, emphasizing the linkage of demographic data, such as censuses, surveys, and projections to future trends in housing and workforce, education, tax paying, voting, and immigration. He's the author of 50 peer-reviewed articles, about 100 other reports and book chapters, uh, and most recently of the book, Immigrants and Boomers, Forging a New Social Contract for the Future of America, which was published by the Russell Sage Foundation in 2007. His work has won major awards from both the American Sociological Association and the American Planning Association, testimony to his interdisciplinary reach. So with no further ado, I will turn the floor over to Professor Dalmeier. Thank you, Professor I have to say, as you read that bio better than I wrote it, um, I realized some of my sentences were too long, but you please cut through those. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out here. Um, I, uh, I will try to do as promised there. I want to get the longer view on immigration, and the longer view for me as a planner also goes into the future, because uh, I'm a sort of unique person in America. I'm a hybrid planner and demographer. We're the only two people who project the future. And so I do it on steroids. Uh, and I'll try to do that. I'm, I'm only going to go over 10 years, though, and it's, I think, mostly in this presentation. It's, um, it's a neglected topic uh, in immigration, housing. Housing really is, has always been really the, uh, a main way in which in immigrants impact the city and benefit uh, the economy. But it really hasn't been part of the debate in the recent immigration. It's been kept off the table for different reasons. Let's just see what we have here. I'm going to go through. Uh, First, look briefly at some long-term trends in immigration, and then go into an extended chapter of this presentation about population age waves. You can't understand immigrants, my thesis is, if you don't understand the rest of, of the population. And just to look at immigrants in isolation, you don't know what's going on. And we'll see there's opposite trends each decade. Some are due to native-born, some are due to immigrants. You have to, you have to look at them together. Uh, and I will then turn to the immigrant waves in particular and I'll focus on home ownership as a key indicator of the housing market. Um, and then I have to end up here with a big question everybody's worried about, so what's going on with the housing market now? You know, there's no money for research in housing. There's no money comes out of HUD, no grants. It's really a problem, it's been a neglected area, and no one knew if housing was important at all until the crash. And then they realized we don't know what we're doing. We don't know exactly how it happened. We haven't got any research established. Uh, and a big question everybody really asked me, the housing industry has had me speak several times this year. Like, what's the new normal? Where are we going now? And uh, we'll address that briefly at the end. I don't actually know the normal, but I do know the, the historic patterns, and we can sort of get a better sense of where it might be going. But there are big questions up in the air still. The first is changing the outlook on immigration. Uh, here's some alternative projections. The first I'm going to start with uh, a data series I constructed about the annual arrivals uh, each year. Um, and I, I calibrate those each decade, so that's roughly the trend, and it turned down after 2000. Uh, this data point here is 2006, before the recession, and here's 2010. So it's been continuing downward. And here's some annual data, this is pretty how noisy it can be. What's important though is what the outlook is. And here's the Census Bureau projections, 2008. They thought, whoa, here's what we're gonna do. And if you wonder where that series comes from, this is, this is really, it's an assumption that goes into the population projection model. That assumption is obviously an extrapolated projection of the prior trend. This, they said, well, it's going to go like that. Uh, with my colleague John Pickin, we were developing our own series of projections uh, right before the 2010 census and afterwards, trying to figure out um, our goal is to, is to bring immigrants into projections more explicitly. The Bureau has them in there by assumption only and doesn't really take account of the immigrants in the results. You just get age, sex, race up the back end. And we have age, sex, race, generation, and nativity, and length of uh, residence in the U.S. for foreign born. So here we consulted some experts. Uh, so what do you think is going to happen to the trend? And we kept our opinion out of it. And the expert opinion we fed into our model 
And we think it basically looks like that, which is trending pretty well, actually, with the recent data. And then here uh, is the nuisance of field projections, 2012, uh, almost a, a, a year ago they came out. And they came out like that. Now, when we, we, when we did ours in 2011, we were lowest than the lowest alternative in the Census Bureau, which is a scary place to be, but we had our expert opinion at the Delphi type of panel that we worked with. That helped us have some confidence. Now, we're above the highest alternative. Uh, I think the Bureau was too high to begin with. Now, I think they're too low. We're holding steady. We think we're not adjusting our right. We think they're going to come back up to us. They're just basically just extrapolating the same trend off a low point right there. Um, that's basically what it looks like. Um, anyhow, uh, it, it's, it's, there's some grave uncertainty as to where things are going. And looking at annual arrivals a little more closely, um, I, I picked a census data, number of people who say they came in the last five years, and I, and I annualized it, basically. And that's the percentage increase in annual arrivals since 1970. So that was, those are the people who arrived in 1965 to 69 for the 70th census. You see the acceleration in the U.S. after 1990, and then turn downward. Here's California. So one reason we've been on top of this from early on is that we peaked early on. Our 1990s recession really turned uh, immigration downward. In L.A. County, it's even more stunning. L.A. County was the epicenter of immigration, and now it's no longer. It's really rolled back to new arrivals to circa you know, 1975 or something. Uh, it's pretty uh, amazing. We have those similar curves to other places, but these are the ones that I, I follow most closely. The cumulative foreign-born share looks something like this. Um, so this is just the annual, this is from the census records themselves. This is the big decline in foreign-born. We call this also the long pause, the 40-year pause, as you know, in immigration. It really creates an amnesia in our political culture as to how normal is immigration. This rapid rebound here is really what has shocked many people politically. They, they think it's not normal to have so many immigrants. Well, we're getting back close to normal. And this is a projection that John Pickett and I have. We have to sell a few Hispanics a little bit higher even. He's up here, um, up at this level up here. Um, and maybe he'll be revising his soon, I, I hope. We don't know. So that, that's how it looks going forward. So right now we're, we're about ready to, we're about back to where we were in the good old days. And it may be leveling off more rapidly than we projected. Now, just one quick slide here on housing before I go into the population age waves. This is looking at the role of immigrants in all of this. This is the immigrant share of growth. And it's a bit of a puzzle here that I want to try to unpack for you as I go forward. Uh, so among renters, uh, immigrants were like 18% of the growth in the 70s. And then they became about 26% of the growth in the 80s. And then a whopping. 60% of the growth in the 1990s of all the growth in rental um, occupants in the U.S. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a huge share and a very big increase before. But by the 2010 census, immigrants had tailed way down. Uh, so there was, there was only, uh, you know, 32% of the half the share. And then going forward, it was something like that. Or conversely, 5%, 10%, 20%, 39%, 30 basically doubling every decade their share of the growth in owner-occupied housing. Now, once you get to 39%, you really can't double again. It's just not feasible to go higher, but it's going down, actually. And so you might, there's a couple puzzles here. One is, so why are immigrants tailing off so much? Is it because of declining arrivals? And why did immigrants boom so much here in the rentals before? And why did owners still go up? And to understand that, you have to know both about the, the rates of upward mobility for immigrants themselves, but since it's a share of the total market, we have to know also about the native born and how much they've increased. And so we'll look at those uh, age growths now. So we'll look at the impact of population age waves, uh, something I think is just underappreciated. Uh, first, I have to give you a little bit of theory. Theory is actually a, a dictum, a dicta. Uh, I start off with, I'm a housing demographer, actually. I didn't I my full qualifications. I, I wrote a book on housing the market a long time ago. There was no interest in it. I banned the field. <laughs> there is no field. There's no field of housing the market, but actually, we urgently need it now. It's a simple idea. People live in housing. It's not actually income that lives in housing, the way economic models have it. It's people that live in housing, assisted by income. There's an income coefficient that helps them. But if you don't have people, you don't have occupied units. 
Uh, and so demand is actually measured um, by occupied units, not price, but just the number of occupied units. That's how demographers look at housing. Uh, and, and there's lots of age regularities that are really modified by the uh, economy. Uh, and I would say that demography is not a dummy variable. Many people think they included demographics when they have a variable for minority. Yes or no, that's a dummy variable. Or let's be more specific, blacks or Latinos. And the reference category is all other, or is white. That's not really demography, that's a dummy variable. Uh, there's something more dynamic. Um, my theory about demography is, is, is more generalized than, than you use it here, um, but it's, it's the basic fact that demography is all about time and about how aggregates evolve over time as their constituent parts are born, age forward, and then die. It's an aggregation process and then, and then movement through time. No other field does that in the same complexity as, as demography does. And it's, it's essential for understanding immigrants. If immigrants are not only aging and moving forward, but they're also uh, settling in and assimilating forward on top of that. So it's a more complex story. Um, and a dummy variable just doesn't really capture it. There's long lag effects. We, you know, we uh, arrive in the market 25 years or 20 years after birth. We know who's coming because we know they're born. We know they're in the pipeline. The, the country of Spain um, precipitated the European crisis in part because they didn't know who was in the pipeline. The Spanish banks didn't track the pipeline. They didn't know there was a big bus coming. The bus hit in 2005, and um, the market fell out, the bottom fell out. There just was no new households the way they expected. Uh, we live in households for 25 years after purchase. Not me, but many people do. Uh, and, you, and they do live in their houses for 40 years. So it was a long leg. So the current homeowner's demand is not expressed by, um, it, it's, it's not the same as what it was when they chose the house. So there's a, there's a gap there. And it, Problems. You, you need to have a different way to frame that. And we have a generational bubble I'll come back to. And the growth of new in, entrance is, is crucial. Everybody agrees on that. It's all the housing experts. Um, you have to have new household formations to buoy the, the housing market from the bottom up. But what we haven't ever paid attention to in the past is housing exits. We haven't had that many exits. But now that the boomers are moving to the top of the ladder, exits are a big deal. I and mean, they're not really part of it of our story. It's the equivalent, the parallel here in immigration is you look at new arrivals without looking at immigration. People are returning home and they can be pretty large immigration. And if you don't account for it, then you don't realize that your net immigration is much smaller than you thought. So um, we also have new immigrant arrivals who, are, who are contribute to house formation, not through their birth in the U.S., but through their arrival in the U.S. and they're a vital factor. And they can give us a much faster impact than births can. The births take 20, 20 years. And new arrivals, we say, really five years is all we need. Uh, and then we have the soaring numbers of seniors as a liability. So this is really the, the, the inter interaction between the demography and the housing is really rich, and it's beyond most models to, to um, capture. So I'm not even going to have a statistical model that tries to put it all into one thing because I don't want to use the dummy variables. I'm just going to try to show you some pictures today and some animations of how the products work. So first, let's look at some facts, so the longer view here on household formation. I was very curious to see over all these decades. Uh, so what's normal here for people of different ages, you know, the percent who head their own household, or form their own household, what is that? So here it is in 2010. And older people have a lot higher household formation, not because they formed a new household, but because they remained in that household after their partner died. Or that's why the rate goes up at, at older ages. Uh, and obviously, it, it rises up right here. Young people are forming households, getting married, or uh, 2007 was very similar, not much difference there. 1980 was the high mark for household formation. That, that was the peak of housing demand in America. Uh, young people had really early, early marriages and they were, they were forming households at a very young age and older people also were living. Uh, it seems to be just really the high, highest point. Uh, 1960, lower. Uh, 1940, painted red because that's the aftermath of the Great Depression. We don't have a 1935 data measure. I so wish we had it. It would be really so valuable that it's not going to exist. Uh, we just don't have a data system. It's like and during the Great Depression, they, there's some local surveys. That are, in some cities, we do better, but nationwide, we don't have it. Uh, so then the curious thing would be 1930, which is spring of 30, which is when, before the impacts of the Depression were felt at all, what does it look like? How high is household formation? It's exactly the same. 
there's no difference there, except to say that the older age, and the older age was from the wrong direction. And then 1920, no difference. Okay, so what do you draw from this? Well, I draw is that basically around age 50, it doesn't matter what decade you live in, your house of formation is about the same. All the changes happen on the shoulders, where we've expanded the formation at young ages and expanded it at older ages. And the contraction is also happening on the shoulders. Not for the senior, but for the young, contracting like that. So expansion and then contraction. That's, that's the bigger picture on house of formation. Let's do the same thing for home ownership, percentage of households who are homeowners. And I think we'll find that we get a little more action out of the Great Depression than that. There's nothing showing there. Uh, here's 2010, here's uh, 2007. You see already a dip downward in, in uh, homeowner rates uh, for middle-aged people and young adults between 2007 and 2010. 1980, the high point, you see it again. 1960, this is really when the uh, FHA programs had kicked in and the, you know, the, all the, the homeowner assistance that we started after the Great Depression. Um, and 1940, and then 1930. So the 1940 was the press downward from the 1930 standard. Um, 1920 was like 1930. So you see a little bit of a flex downward uh, in homeownership rates. Again, to the end of the decade after there was a little bit of recovery in the late 30s. So more variation that way. Another way to slice it, instead of doing it by period, we can do it by age group. And so we can look here specifically at people ages 75 to 79, how constant is their home ownership rate across the decades, and we can get something like that. So a little bit of upturn here, not because they're buying new houses, but because these are the, the beneficiaries of the long boom of the 50s and 60s, now carrying forward their home ownership in their retirement years. They inherited this from when they were age 35. Um, let's turn here, more interesting, age 35 to 39, big increase after World War II because of FHA loans that, that really helped people to buy a lower down payment, which meant earlier in life. Uh, and then at age 30, 34, 25, 29, you see in all these, there's a little bit of a blip upward here in 2006 in the housing bubble, and then a crash downward after the bubble blip, and then a crash, slight little wrinkles, and then 2024. And now looking forward to the next five years, I don't know. <laughs> um, we really don't know. We're not sure. Because there's so much up for grabs. This is the most volatile period, we think, in American history. Because you have demography at such a turning point. You have the political situation in Washington at such a turning point. The Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the, the major institutions are up for grabs. They could take them off the table. We don't know. But, so we really don't know what will happen in the next two years even. Um, and then economically, we're coming out of this deep recession more slowly than expected, and we aren't, we're not so sure about that even. We know we're recovering. We know it's slow, and uh, that's probably the least uncertain of, of the other parts. But it really is uh, an unknown period. Now, I want to talk to you here briefly about somebody who does know. How he does know, and yet he doesn't know. And I, I've had him in my slideshows for some time, but I had to bring him out today. This is Robert Schiller. He just won the Nobel Prize. And everybody should admire him for his foresight about the bubble because he published this graph. This is off his website. He published this graph only at this point. He stopped, he stopped in 2005 at that peak. And he said, here's a long-term uh, series of house prices. There was a little blip in the late 70s and a little blip in the 1980s and this big whopper blip right now. And, and folks, this is not sustainable. That's what he said. <laughs> and he published it. And ever since he's been updating every quarter, I, I assume with great glee as he watches <laughs> the downturn and, and then tracks the, you know, what's happening. So you have to admire him for going out on a limb and um, congratulate him on his prize, and it's deserved. However, I'm a demographer, and he's not. <laughs> he does not understand population. This, this is off his web page, this is his colors. He thinks population is a straight pink line. And he says it's not a factor. It hasn't varied, and it can't explain these, these, uh, these bubbles. Here's a house building cost, and it doesn't explain the bubbles. Here's interest rates, it does not explain the bubbles. And certainly not population, it's a flat, constant, pink line. I take exception to that, of course. And I'll show you some data that addresses that quite emphatically. I tried to get the raw data myself, and I, I didn't get a pink line, but I got a steady progression of gray bars. So the total population looks like you graphed it. That's the total. 
The thing is, the total population does not predict well housing demand. It's all about age groups. You have to break it down into the segments that count, especially young age groups or new immigrant age groups. And he doesn't have that here. So these are just the, the total U.S. population. So instead, we're going to look at it like by age group. And I like to kind of joke a little bit and say that you can see the difference here between these different decades. Some of them are the gap is wider here and narrower over there. Uh, you know, you see how that's so narrow and so wide. But of course, you can't really see it. So I'm going to do the arithmetic for you and take the first differences and calculate the increment each decade by age group. And we'll see what's happening. I'll just show it to you every other decade for um, clarity. So here's the U.S. population growth um, every, you know, every decade. So we start with the 1950s, and we'll do the 70s, we'll do the 90s, and we'll do the current decade we're in now. And so, boom, there's a growth in the 1950s. No surprise, right? There's the baby boom generation. What was interesting to me is two things. First off, there wasn't that much growth anywhere else. And in fact, there was a loss in the ages 25, 34. In the 1950s, a period when we had the massive suburbanization, and we had all this building boom, and we were losing young people. How's that possible? How did that work exactly? So that's what it was in the 1950s. This age group really is crucial. Because that's the house of formation age. That's the first time buyer age. That group's got to grow. If it doesn't grow, you can't actually support construction. You can't support growth in the market. So here we go to the um, 1990s. In the 1990s, everything reverses. We now have a loss of children in terms of relative to prior growth. And we have this huge resurgence here of um, growth in the, uh, in the early the 20s and early 30s. And it is no mystery where that comes from because that's my people. That's the baby boomers. We did that. I watched that and I was in, in Boston in that period and that's when um, everything started. That's when gentrification began. That's when yuppies were discovered. Uh, it, it was just a flooding of the young age group which is being recreated today by the millennial generation. They're not so special. They're just a hippie generation Recreated with maybe better values and better haircuts, <laughs> <laughs> nicer hats, whatever else it takes. But this turnaround here is, has, has vital impact on the housing market, as I'll explain. And then in the 1990s, again, it reverses. Now we're losing people, uh, even worse than in the 50s, we're losing people in that prime age group again. And that this, 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 seahorse, this seesaw rocking up and down has to have an impact. But it, it wasn't visible to people. And instead, now the growth is out here in late middle age. Um, and this is an important age group, 45, 54, because they have the most money in America. They have the biggest houses. They need the biggest houses because they have the biggest families. Or at least they have the families with the biggest needs for space because their children are teenagers and older who all drive their own cars. So you need to have the double wide driveway and a big garage. And you need to have a separate wing on one end of the house for the parents so they won't listen to the music from the kids on the other end of the house. It fueled this large house boom um, because of, of so many people who are the growth in this, in this range here. Um, and now I just want to go forward to the current decade. And the current decade, we have a revival once again here, 25-34, that's the millennials. But we're losing people in that prime age, and now the, the market for exurban large houses is, is dropping just because of this. And we have an explosion of seniors over 65. So everybody knows it's a big deal, but we've never been there before. It's never happened in the US. We don't actually know what to expect. We don't know how to think about it seriously. Uh, and it's frightening, frankly, for many people who are involved in it. Uh, they're going to rely on it. Looking at Census Bureau data and then projections, this is taking it by five year age groups over the last 20 years. And you see where all the growth has been in the nation massive baby boom generation swelling the ranks of the, of the middle age, the prime earners, the prime taxpayers, the big house buyers. It doesn't get any better than this. That's, just, that's the best profile you can get for economic growth in, in a nation. And here we go forward, the census bureau projections the next 20 years. And uh, we basically flatline in that former breadbasket of growth. We have some resurgence here due to millennials. But their, but their upward burst is not as powerful as what the boomers were for them. They're bigger in number and total, but they don't have the same increment of, of lift. So I don't know if they're going to have the same impact, especially with this flat spot in front of them. Um, so it's a very different profile that we're looking at, and we're trying to think ahead. How does it change the city? How does it change politics? And it does in many ways, but it doesn't do it overnight. And people are 
resisting this knowledge. And we're coming out of the recession, so we're distracted by the recession. We think all the changes are due to the recession. We don't realize the demographics are changing. That in five years, everybody's five years older. Uh, in another five years, another five years older. And so it moves immeasurably forward. The reason it's so important is something I developed um, a while back in the Lincoln Institute um, uh, publication is that we don't have consumer sovereignty in housing in America. We have a minority dictatorship. Basically, 1% determines what gets built for housing in America. That 1% is whoever is it that occupies uh, a new unit. If you don't occupy a new unit, you don't count from a developer standpoint. They don't care about anybody except the prospects for new units. And that's the clientele they cater to. Everybody else lives in hand-me-downs. Leftovers, they were built for somebody else in a different generation. Myself, I've never lived in a new unit. I've always been living in hand-me-downs, except when I was a young kid in the 50s, and we were living in a house built for us, uh, our, you know, our young parents, so the baby boomers. Uh, and so the point here is that 1% has enormous leverage. I think it comes out of whatever is a growing segment in that decade. That growing segment feeds the, the development See, that's where the, the best prospects are. There, theirs is the need that's unmet by the market. And so that's where the developers put new product to meet the needs of, the, of those uh, of those growing segments. And so what I just showed you was giving you an idea of what the segments might be. Now, uh, here, Penn and I, gosh, several years ago, John Pick and I presented this, I think I showed this very slide, um, which is a number of people turning age 25. Um, it's the native born turning 25, but that's this dotted line at the bottom here. And then with, on top of that, the immigrant arrivals in that, in that year, on top of that. And this is sort of the, the, the vital underpinnings of the housing market in terms of the growth in housing demand. And I just want to make one point. It's not pink and it's not straight. It is bobbing up and down. And it corresponds to four tr major turning points in urban history as we wrote about in our article, uh, demographic forces and turning points in the American city. Uh, the first one there um, was a downturn in the 50s. Remember we had fewer young people in the 50s? That's what led to urban decay and the emptying out of central cities as people went to the suburbs. There was no replacements that came behind and there were no immigrants. Homer Hoyt wrote about this in 1939 or 1940 in economics. He said, we've cut off immigration. There's no replacements in the city. When people move out to the suburbs, there's no replacements. And that led to this, this, this downturn that um, afflicted New York City, the, the gray areas, they called it, and across the East Coast. So it will be included, I'm sure. Followed by the boom, the long boom in the 1970s and 80s, and really continued because of this upward surge due to baby boomers, plus immigrants now picking in on top of that, enormous increase in demand, which is what has generated the affordability problems that drove up prices, we started gentrification problems because we overflowed our neighborhoods where we were supposed to be and went into working class neighborhoods and pushed demand outward. There's just too many people being added too quickly and supply couldn't respond. Uh, and then another downturn happening here uh, unheralded in the 1990s, which was involved, well, I'll come back to I show you the graph earlier how rental went down. Uh, young people live in apartments and you have a shrinking number of young people and you undercut the growth in demand for apartments. We didn't build apartments. And going forward, I'll come to this. This is uh, the, the generational bubble that's looming ahead. So first, let me, I'm going to skip over this, the first two phases because for time reasons, and just look at the more current ones. The multifamily demand is reviving right now. Uh, here's a profile of tenants who actually live in, in um, new apartments. This is in census data. It's just people in five or more unit structures that were built in the last five years. And then the question is, who lives there? What percentage of the people are in each age group? And, and I did a profile of two different decades, 1980, the high point of demand, and, and 2000. Basically, it's really bunched up with people under age 35. If you're shrinking those age groups, you really don't give the developers a lot of incentive to go and build apartments. I suppose if you had a really big uptick down here when the boomers get down to here, that will give more incentive. But historically, it's young people who live in apartments. There's some kind of some real oddities that occur as a result of this, too. I mean, you wonder, okay, so poor people live in apartments, so they live in hand-me-downs. Housing is filtered down or trickled down. Um, and, but they, they're overcrowded because they have you know, three kids and or four kids, and they're living in apartments with one bedroom and two bedroom. Why not have more apartments built with three or four bedrooms? 
Well, we used to have that in New York City. I know that big apartment buildings were built in the 1920s and earlier for big families. But um, modern construction after, after World War II has been built all, you know, basically two bedrooms or one bedroom or studios. They're all built for middle class who can afford new construction. If you're middle class and you can afford new construction and you have kids, you go to single family. You need more space. So who lives in apartments? People without kids. Singles. Couples. Maybe a baby. They're the ones that are the tenants for the, the middle class tenants for the new construction. So all the housing built small for that clientele. And then everybody else who's poor and larger families lives in it as a hand me down later. I haven't figured out a solution for this. There's a disconnect in time. You know who's going to live in it later, but the client is now. And the client dictates. It's a, it's a minority dictatorship of that 1%. So it doesn't, uh, we don't have, I can't figure out a solution. But that's where it comes from. And so here's a, a, the time record here of the history in the US. It was like 35% of all the construction in the 60s and 70s was in apartments back in the glory days of suburbanization, and then put a dive down to here. Uh, and stay down there. And then more recently, it's a different time scale here, but more recently, <coughs> it's been ping pong up and down because the recession has interfered. But it's trying to revive. It's trying to come back up. It started to lift up here before the recession, and it's coming again now. It needs to come back up. The neighbors who resist new construction in neighborhoods, they think this is odd. They think apartments are strange. They want to maintain normal. They don't know that normal was what was in the 60s and the 70s. And that that's what we're going back to because now we have a more normal number of people who are in their 20s than we did in the 90s. We had a baby bus generation in the 90s. After the baby boom came the bus, the bus was sitting in the 1990s and the 80s or the 20s, and it blanked out all kinds of um, apartment construction. And so now it's three down. Baby boomer sell off comes uh, a little later here, and it starts the end of this decade. Um, people have resisted me on different different ways on this, but here's just the raw data. This is raw as it gets, but in cohort form. It's the number of homeowners by age. And at two points in time, one is 2000 and the other one is 2010. 2000 and 2010. And so here they are, and they increase their homeownership. Here they are, they increase it a little bit, uh, and they're starting to go with it falls, and now it starts to like really sell off. These people will go over here. They have to. And it's way higher than the cohort ahead of them. Way higher. And so that's that it's that shift on the upswing, the shift, the upshift is what drove up housing demand. And the risk here is now you have this excess of sellers that are going to push down demand. And I just caution everybody's first reaction to seeing this is okay, I should go out and sell my house today. And I caution you that you can't all do that at once. And besides, I already sold my house this year. <laughs> you, have wait, you have to wait till next year. And it doesn't make any, it won't do any good. The solution, I have a social policy solution, which we have to basically build up the, the client demand. We have to invigorate, fortify the younger generation so that they can buy more houses at a higher price. We have to invest in the next generation, cultivate the future home buyers, or else this is not going to look good. They get ahead. We still have a little bit of time. We should have started 10 years ago, but we still have a little bit of time, um, and maybe we can get on top of this. But that, that's a key dynamic. So there's this ratio of seniors to working age, and it's, we're blind to it. This is the U.S. ratio. Here's the California ratio. We're a little bit younger. It's the number of people who are um, uh, somehow the rest of it. It's, it's, that's going from 1970 to 2010. I don't know why the axis is not displaying. <coughs> 1970 2010, and the ratio here is about 24 seniors per 100 for the U.S., 21 per 100 for the uh, California. Seniors are 65 plus, working age I call it 25 64. It's not changing, it doesn't matter whatever I said, but it's not changing, it's flat. Anything that's flat is invisible, we take it for granted, we can't imagine what it means, it's, it's not worth discussing, it never changes, forget about it. And that's where we are. But being a demographer, I like to push the numbers forward. You have the data. It's not hard to do. And there it goes. So it goes up you know, to 40, 48. In California, oops, California is up like 70%. I don't know. This is not displaying completely. I'm sorry. Um, California is um, up a lot. So it has impacts on Social Security, on Medicare, all the deficit you hear about, the future deficit in Washington is because of this chart. And I, 
you know, if the chart was completed, if the access it would, it would be better documented, but you see the pattern. And all Obama has to do is just to show the chart. It's not a political debate. This is what's happening with the budget and the future deficit. But he can't use a chart. He can't show a chart. He can't show a chart because of one man who preceded him, Ross Perot. Ross Perot had a chart. <laughs> Ross Perot pointed, pointed to the chart and touched with a giant sucking sound of jobs. And, and everybody made great fun of Ross Perot. And Obama's already on defensive for being too professorial already. He can't, he can't, he just can't do it. He can't point to a chart. But somebody should show a chart. So Biden should do it. Biden should show a chart. <laughs> this is the basic facts of life. It's nobody's fault. We have to adjust to this. Uh, and it's funny, I, I'll be happy to send you a complete version later. I don't know why it's not showing. But in that context, in my book, Immigrants and Boomers, I said it all starts with the boomers. Boomers came first. Boomers are the big voters. Boomers are the cause of all the problems. Now, let's ask, how about those immigrants? You can't talk about immigrants in isolation. You have to see them in the context of the complete population. And they are a vital component that makes up for some big gaps that we have in our population. If you don't know about the boomers, you don't know about immigrants. So I'm going to focus here just on the, the housing side today. Uh, and this is a growth in the number of immigrant renters and owners. This is a study we, we issued this spring for the Mortgage Bankers Association. They commissioned it a year ago. On the, uh, John and I did this. Uh, and we had a great model to do the U.S. And they said, that's fine, but could you do it for every state? I'm like, oh my God, every state. There's no data. I mean, we don't even know how many immigrants that I mean, oh my gosh. So we, what we did, I'll show you the state results in a second, but really the U.S. is still the most relevant. The point being that owners are still growing among immigrants, and renters are declining. And we think they're going to, through a more elaborate model, we think they're going to decline further, and owners will decline, or will increase further, the gap will widen. It used to be rising in, in synchronization, so how's that? You might speculate, well, it's changing origin countries for immigrants, or is it a, a matter of the, the downturn and the recession, da 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 Well, if it's a downturn and a recession, people are being foreclosed, how come owners are still rising? Shouldn't owners be going down? Well, it's a demographic um, twist here that we'll have to look at. It's actually one of the strongest regularities I found in the entire housing market. It's the rate at which immigrants climb the ladder to home ownership. And so here is a quick summary here for Latinos and non-Latinos. And looking and tracking arrival cohorts that were new in 1990, and then here they are 10 years longer settled in 2000, and 10 years longer settled in 2010, and our projection in 2020. Um, and it's, it, they're just tracking in parallel. The, the non Latinos are, are, have, have more resources, they have higher home ownership. The Latinos, starting from a low point, they climb at exactly the same rate. It's an enormous upward thrust in, toward home ownership, and vital. To, um, to, to firming up the demand in our, our, our weakened housing market. As a matter of fact, I recently just updated this data for uh, some other places. Here's the U.S. again at, in detail, and I'll show you some states. But first, this is the total form of native-born homeownership rate, which has been rising since the 1970-2010. And here's the total foreign-born homeownership rate, which is falling. As you can tell by that downward trend, that's not good. It looks like immigrants are failures. They're not keeping up with the native born. They, they just can't hack it in America. The gap is widening, and you could point to that as a sign of uh, growing disparity, growing disadvantage, or just plain failure, depending on how you want to characterize it. But it's wrong. It's just an average of all immigrants, regardless of how old they are, regardless of how long they live in the U.S. To get a halfway decent picture here, you're going to have to look at new arrivals, like those people who came before 1970, and look at what happened to their home ownership rate, <coughs> or those who came before 1980, or those who came before 1990, or those who came before 2000, and they're all shooting up <coughs> a rocket. Uh, and there's one little oddity here. Here's the 2010 result. This is from a different data set. This is now the American Community Survey instead of the census, and so there's a little bit of difference. But it's not that the, the data are, are comparable. And the new arrivals are coming in with higher home ownership than before, after the recession. Uh, we have two explanations. We, this, we're still hypotheses. We haven't verified these, but we do know that these facts are pretty apparent. 
the, the mix of origins has shifted over this decade. Before it was pretty constant, Latino and Asian was pretty steadily mixed the last 30 years. In this decade, Latino has shrunken, and, and so they're a smaller share, and if they're a lower homeownership rate, well, their, their contribution is depressed. The others have a higher weight, and so it's bobbing upward, probably for that. Another reason is, in all the other decades, immigration was rising steadily across the decade. So at the end of the decade, it was higher than the beginning of the decade. And so the newest arrivals were more numerous than the earlier arrivals in every decade. In this current decade, immigration is turning downward. And so there's fewer newcomers relative to the old timers. And the old timers have higher homeownership. And so that's also bobbing the rate up. Regardless of whatever the impact of the, re of the recession was in the crash, somehow the homeownership rate is able to, to maintain itself and bob upward. It might have been even higher if it hadn't been for the recession. And I can show you some data later that suggest that. But here's the states. Uh, California, New York, Florida, Texas, Illinois. We recreated this with census data and ACS data. And you know, you see the same upward bob in every one of these. It's a very constant fact. Uh, but I think immigration has turned the mix has changed everywhere, I think. Uh, Latinos have dried up across the country. So uh, that that's probably probably the explanation. But the point here is that is that here in California where it was it was coming down, foreign born share was coming down, foreign born home ownership rate was coming down, now it's turned back upward. And here it's coming down in Texas and now it's turned back upward. Because the old timers are now more numerous. The long settled immigrants are starting to their their the weight in the, in the overall economy is rising. Before all you had was newcomers and that kept things low. But as we have immigration more mature in many of our states, we have then longer settled immigrants, more of whom are homeowners. You will not believe what percentage of Mexican immigrants in California become homeowners by the time they've been here more than 30 years. It's one of the most astounding numbers I've come across. Um, Mexican immigrants, by and large, are the poorest immigrants. Uh, some are better off, but a lot of them are from northern Mexico. They come from rural backgrounds, they have low education. They don't have a lot of resources. They start with low homeownership. They work their way up. Um, and, and it's expensive in our state. Uh, the average homeownership in California is 54%. U.S. is 64. We're lower because it's more expensive. It takes longer to save it for a down payment. In that context, where the average is 54%, after 30 years, Mexican immigrants, 61% are homeowners. After 30 years of settlement. And it, it's an extraordinary story, the American dream. They're not buying the most expensive houses, but they're firming up the bottom of the housing market in the, in the mansion in Beverly Hills. sits on a pyramid of lower-priced houses with working men at the bottom, pushing upward, lifting that housing market. It goes out and they tremble as they what comes next. I think it would be more affordable housing. But as a homeowner and a voter, and 80% of California voters are homeowners, we really don't want to see that much affordability. <laughs> at least not, <laughs> and at least not that quickly. So that this is a, in the voting interest here of the public, which is a very important if you want to build a consensus for immigration reform. What's in it for the voters? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on a campaign that homeownership is the pathway to getting consensus. What's in it for me? I want to know who my future uh, homeowner is. Um, so here, looking at the growth in renters now, I want to come back to this paradox we saw earlier, where there was a few immigrants and a lot of immigrants and fewer immigrants. Why fewer immigrants? Because more of them have moved into homeownership in, in this decade. Why are there so few native-born renters here? And so many more native renters here? Well, the story might be over here. Well, we had, had Great Recession. People got, you know, people had, had to rent. They couldn't afford home buying. Yeah, that's true. But also, remember, this is the decade when we had so few young people. We're losing young people. And there wasn't much, there weren't that many renters. And now we have a plethora of young people again. And it's fueling the, the rental market. So that, so the native born came back at the same time as, as, as foreign born went down. They complemented each other. Without immigrants here, we would have a much softer housing market. Without native born here, we would have a much softer housing market. So they're too complimenting. They're, they're counterbalancing. That's for renters. Here's owners. And you know, for a very small number of foreign-born, um, it's grown. And the native-born grew enormously in the 90s. Housing was, was more affordable then, to begin with. And then many, much less growth, because less affordable and fewer young people in their 30s in the entry-level home, home buying ages. So it's a couple of things in combination. 
and then we think going forward, the millennials are, it's, it's question mark. But we kind of want the millennials to act like normal and start to buy houses, which they, they're obstructed from doing for several reasons. High unemployment rates, very discouraging. Student loan debt, we really shouldn't saddle anybody with student loan debt because we want them to be good home buyers instead. <laughs> and you're wasting your money on student loan debt, which we should defer that debt or we should absolve you of the debt and please buy our houses instead. <laughs> that would be the trade-off and make everybody happier. Um, I will argue that in Congress if given a chance. All across America, houses look, is it just a few states? It used to be back in 1990, only 10 senators cared about immigration. Those are the senators from New York, New Jersey, Texas, Florida, uh, California, maybe Illinois, so maybe 12 senators. All across America, it's changed because now immigration has spread out across the nation. Um, and so here's the immigrant share of the growth in renters in the current decade, right now, 2010 to 2020, that we project. And in the Northeast, it's pretty huge. Without uh, immigrants, you don't have any growth. Uh, this is the U.S. total right here. California's right there. The high state here is Illinois. This is the D.C. region. We, we kind of had to lump them together for market reasons, D.C. and, and, and the states are around D.C. The cluster. Okay, that's, that's the growth in renters. Here's the growth in uh, owners. And uh, New Jersey, almost 100% depended on growth in the foreign born for demand. Uh, California, 70% of the growth in homeowners is from um, immigrants. You know, this is not the share of the total homeowners, it's the share of the growth. But the growth is what drives the market. It's what supports prices. You don't have growth, prices go soft and sad. So it's a pretty vital component right across the, the whole nation. I mean, we had to leave some residual links like the rest of the West, the small states bunched together. There's the rest of the South, the small states. And so they, they have a lower share. But even there, it's, you know, it's almost 20% in the South, in the residual. So it's a, it's a pretty strong component right across the, the nation. So I come to this question now, what is the new normal? And I tell you again, I do not have the answer. But this definitely is not the answer. This is what the Census Bureau distributed most recently. This is the latest report from the Housing Vacancy Survey. And it shows conveniently the trend in the home market rate. They, they decided to superimpose the, uh, the seasonal adjusted with the quarterly, just so you can see the difference. And the answer is not much difference. It's not really worth showing. Uh, it goes from 1995 to 2011. Now, people see this chart and they get kind of nervous. What, what do you think is going to happen next year or the next five years? What's your projection based on this chart? What goes up must come down. You know, so it like use the peak and it's just like the bottomless trend here. We're just going to go down here. And housing experts don't think that's going to happen. But the public at large looks at this and we've got to worry. And people who are not as expert about housing worry. But it's just really the time frame is wrong. We've got to see it in a longer time frame. So let me show you going back to like 1930s. There's the home ownership rate in the U.S. And here is this little, little bubble right here that they're graphing right there. Now you can see it in context. And what comes next, you know, it's probably something out of that here. We'll see. And we have to, like, depends on what, how fast the economy improves and what we do about student loans and other things. Uh, but but uh, home ownership rate is so stable for so long. There's a lot of inertia locked up in it. People don't sell their houses. It's not like uh, buying toothpaste where you have to do it every week or every month. It's, it's, it's got enormous inertia. It's not like unemployment. You get a new job every year, and it can, it can vary. It's very stable. It can sag gradually because the young generation can't make it, and it'll sort of drift downward slowly. But it doesn't plunge. This is a pretty unusual upward turn right here. When it started in 1995, we saw it. And we wondered, first of all, I thought data error. <laughs> it, it hasn't moved for like three decades. Why is it looking upward? Well, there were some policy changes that did kick it upward. But then it kept going after 2000, and that's when it got really uh, out of control right here. And then, of course, not surprising at all, it's correcting back to normal. So normal, just do a four-year, four-decade average, and call that normal. That'd be one measure of normal. Looking at it in the last five years, though, we can get a, another view. We can look at it in terms of cohorts using these same data, their data, the Housing Vacancy Survey, and connect that people five years older. 
from what they were. And so uh, here are all these cohorts. So at the top of the stack here, they 65, 69, in, 19, in, in 2000. And here they are in 2005. So this is before the crash. And so these people were actually were trending upward. They were actually moving into homeowning before, in the bubble. They were being, people who had never been homeowners were being seduced into homeownership because it was such a good deal. They couldn't resist. They're the ones I feel for. They get suckered in late in life. They can't, haven't got time to recover. There wasn't a whole lot, but you see a little upward trend. And of course, these people just shot up like a rock, went like a rock. At least in five years' time, there's a lot of increase in homeownership. Now you want to see that five years after the crash, it was from 2007 <laughs> to 2012, the most recent data. Surprising thing is that young people still were able to make gains, just a lot less progress than before. And up here, uh, they're not going up anymore, except for these guys. Somehow they're still climbing. I don't actually understand why. Um, uh, there's a retirement age, something funny could be happening right there. They're going to be buying into retirement community, something happening. Uh, but it's pretty stable. So after the crash, you actually don't see this giant collapse. What, what it was is a shortfall of gains that should have happened among young people and didn't happen. And we're still waiting for young people to kick in now and make those big gains, and they're still not showing up. The realtors are crying about why are there so few first time buyers? Where are the first time buyers? First time buyers don't trust us. They're sitting back waiting, like, are you guys crazy? I mean, like, am I going to lose my shirt? You know, how, how about 4% interest rate? I don't trust you. <laughs> they don't trust us. And they're, you know, they're scared. Uh, and they're not sure about their jobs. Unemployment is hitting young people the most. Uh, I got two sons in their 20s. I know all about it. Uh, they moved to a different state. I won't say which one. Um, to try to you know, find better jobs. It, it's a bad time. But let's go back to the last decade and look at the pattern of things. I still don't trust the most recent. Let's just go and see the last, in the 1990s, the first half of the 90s, second half of the 90s. What does that look like? And so here's a cohort from 2000. Uh, no, um, and so I'm going to measure the increment here. This is, instead of showing all those, those lines, those look like bars. For a cohort starting in 1990, starting in 95, starting in 2000, starting in 2007, by right, age. And so here's the 1990 to 95 increment. So the young people have a big lift into homeownership, an increase in every age group. And here it is in 1995. The end of the decade was much better. Uh, low prices, just, just better market conditions, and you see that every cohort is moving rapidly into homeownership. And here it is in the first half of the 2000s, uh, and it gets, it's more like it was in the first half of the 90s, and then here comes the, the crash. And we painted red for obvious reasons. Uh, real losses are occurring through here, and a massive shortfall right there. So it looks to me the real problem is getting the younger generation, the homeownership rate elevated, there's more young people to draw upon, but the rate is depressed, and it has to be brought up. Takeaways, first off, watch the ups and downs of those demographic age waves. Don't forget about those. They're always forgotten. And uh, then the same for ups and downs of new immigrant arrivals. We were used to this long increase, well now we have a downturn, and we can see what happens with the downturn. Um, the immigrants have an extraordinarily strong and consistent demand because it doesn't occur when they first arrive, it builds over time. So it's like a, it's like a time release capsule. It, it's a positive benefit for 30 years after they arrive. The combination of the two, if immigrant plus revived demand is a much stronger outlook going forward. It's working with all cylinders now, or firing. But we had the problem here the aging sellers to prepare for. Uh, no young person's gonna buy my house right away. I'm in too high a bracket because I've been climbing the ladder too long. I need a young person who's buying their second house. They have to buy the first house first and get ready to buy my second house. And so we really have to cultivate the future uh, and, and generation. And don't forget about population. Despite Nobel Prizes, it's not a straight pink line. It's not. So that's up there. Thank you. Thanks very much, y'all. We have um, ample time for questions, so uh, please uh, ask away. And if you could identify yourself uh, when you're asking a question and speak loudly and clearly, that would be great. Thank you. 
questions about the, um, the market side or the housing side or the connection? I'll start with a question. Um, huh? Eric Kleinenberg uh, recently wrote his book, Going Solo, in which he talked about the shifting composition of households. And that's the one uh, factor that I didn't see in your analysis, which is the increase in the number of small or single households and um, the, the shrinking in size of other households and what impact that might have um, vis-a-vis the housing market and also vis-a-vis -vis immigration because household composition is presumably different from native born there. And I'm wondering if you've thought about that or how that factors into thinking about this bigger picture. Um, he, he's written a book about a trend that started in 1970 and was largely completed by 1990. It's not a new trend. Um, there was a, a sharp downturn earlier. A lot of it is aging of older people who live alone. It's not just the young singles. And it's also young singles who are delaying marriage today. I think we can encapsulate most of that in the age group analysis. I don't think you have to actually break out the, the household size by age. Um, the trends in the age group um, absorb um, most of that effect of the, of the household size. Um, I think if you were looking at the size of units purchased, you would want to look much more closely at how many children they have and, and how many people live in the house. But the big paradox has been over the last 20 years, 30 years, is that household size has been shrinking since 1970, and the size of houses being built has been growing. <laughs> it's been growing throughout. It only paused for like two years during the Great Recession, and now it's resumed its upward trend again. Go figure. The size of the houses is not being correlated with the size of people of the houses that occupy it. Uh, I think you're safer to stay sticking to the age analysis and not going off on the sidebar of marital status, um, gender, or um, family size. Those are definitely important when you get down to the bottom line of the specific choices, but in the aggregate, they don't add um, they don't add as much as they as they distract from the overall trend. Yeah, uh, this is great. Um, I'd like to, if you could 
talk a little more about the dynamics of the home body, um, particularly in relationship to the movement of other groups uh, out of housing. Is this kind of model that you're describing in kind of uh, updated Chicago school the secession model? I think of it, you know, in particular, along with uh, Kenneth King's group, um, we're looking at integration of the revitalization. Um, it's clear that the overall that whites have left that city, African Americans have left the city number, immigrants have moved in a large number. I'm trying to figure out how to understand whether um, the white of migration has made housing prices affordable or that's what's attracting immigrants. Um, Well, there's a lot of moving parts, aren't there? It's a lot of moving parts, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've watched this in, on the ground in, in different uh, cities, but especially in Los Angeles the last um, 20 years or so. Um, immigrants tend to move into areas that are not competed for um, by others. They find soft spots. And I, I sometimes think of it as immigrants are sort of probing um, widely. And then when someone scores a hit and realizes that there's, once you're living on a block and you take notice of what's happening next door and across the street, and you know before anybody else knows it's going to be a house that's vacant. Then they tell their friends and relatives. And if it's a good deal and it's cheap, then they, you're able to get other people to join them. So there's early pioneers. Simplification works the same way, by the way. The early pioneer. They then tell their friends, and through a network, they bring other people who will then come to this location. One of the, the things that works in immigrants' favor is they have different standards for housing and, and then um, native-born Americans. Whites and blacks are similar in this case I found. Uh, they, they share similar ideas about what's normal in terms of how crowded should the house be. Uh, they have similar ideas about you know wh what is expected for middle class in America. Immigrants who come from other countries don't know those rules. And they will they'll satisfy for things that are substandard by, by middle class standards. And uh, that allows them, I think, to, to make it viable for them, and so they can cut costs in a way that's acceptable to their to them. And so that's an advantage they have, and, and they can then squeeze in to an area. I wonder about how they get jobs in, the, in some of those, in cities that are outside of the existing area. It depends on the economy in those cities. I mean, you know, Somalis and Lewiston, Maine, I always tell them the most. Go anywhere, it's so cold, and you know, why, what's a big job? There's no big job attraction. But somehow they're able to manufacture a niche there. Uh, I think it's like it, it's a different standard. They don't expect the same um, hourly wage. They don't expect the same return on investment. And they're able to uh, make a go of it where other people can't, won't accept it. They just won't accept it. In, this, in these small cities, we're looking at something like 70 or 80 percent of the foreign people are working outside of the city. They commute. Yeah. So it's a residential. Um, they have the kind of reservation for all those people. Yeah. Well, um, it's cheaper housing, and they are, um, and and they're improving the value of it to themselves. You know, how, we always say housing is a bundle of attributes. It's the physical shelter, but it's also the, the neighborhood location. It's the schools. It's the amenities around it. Part of the amenities are your fellow fellow countrymen. As you have more and more of a friendly, supportive network in your community, that is valuable to your group. So we see this, for example, in Koreatown in L.A., where the Koreans pay top dollar. And there's been some discrimination lawsuits. I'm wondering why is this, is, is this apartment building turning all Korean? Is this new Korean owner discriminating against Latinos? He won't accept Latino tenants? No, he's priced it really high. And only Koreans will pay that premium because that location is valuable to Koreans. It's not valuable to anybody else. And so they self-select into, into that. And so, so by attracting your, your country folk to come to your neighborhood, you actually make that, that housing much more attractive to you and, and to your, and your fellow you know, peers. And so that's, sort of, that's probably how the network how it consolidates. And to, to break away from the network, you've got to find something really with a big advantage. And that would probably be a, a huge job advantage or, or something. So I think it starts with housing market soft and there's lots of vacancies. Uh, the first time I ever noticed this, this housing demography dynamic was in a New York Times story back in the 1970s. I was still in college at Columbia University as an anthropology student. 
and it was talking about why um, uh, blacks are moving into Jewish neighborhoods in Queens. I forget which, which neighborhood it was. And it described the most biological demographic explanation you can imagine. There were four-story walk-ups. Where do you think blacks first began to live in the Jewish neighborhood? The Jews were getting older. Their children were utterly mobile and leaving the community. Who's going to live in the top floor unit? Somebody young. Somebody strong, whoever it is. It can be probably a group that's growing, not a group that's shrinking. And they happen to be African Americans. And so they started on the top floor, and then they worked their way down to the third floor, and then the second floor, and then the first floor. And that was a, just an organic way of, 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 of integrating into the, the, the apartment buildings. I thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> it's just so human, you know? It's just like, there's no, it's just how it happens. Because people are getting older. Um, on some of the things you're saying, but so when I, when when Demetrius Papa Demetrius comes, right? I, I expect that if he like other people so in this campus, he's going to tell us that the United States, like other countries, we should let in more high-skilled, high-wage immigrants, right? Um, which is been a trend in major immigrant-receiving nations around the world. Right? How does that sort of very powerful uh, idea about what our immigration policy should be impact your story, right? And, and to what extent okay, would you push back on? Well, I mean, I, I would accept that. I wouldn't push back on it. Um, I could push back on it in addition, but you know, basically, I, I think it's very positive. You bring in high school workers, you bring in better home buyers. Okay, so that reinforces, and better taxpayers. That's all that's positive. Um, the trouble is this. I'm an average American voter. I don't care about what Silicon Valley is trying to hire. I don't mean anything to me. You know, I, you know, maybe someone who's responsible who's a head of the Chamber of Commerce cares. Maybe the president should care. But why should I, the little guy, the voter, care? I don't care. I mean, and when I retire from my job, I don't care who replaces me. That's their problem. When I'm gone, they're going to miss me. That's, that's their attitude. What they care about is their housing. I'm an urban planner. I know the number one thing that determines politics in local areas is house values. People fight against projects because of what's going to do to house values. They do not want to have their house values threatened. I know that from the ground. And so if you want to communicate with the voters, you might say those other things. Those are good to have. But the, the home buying connection is going to be more persuasive to them than what benefit might have to Silicon Valley. But I would also push back on the employment side as well. I would say, okay, we might need a lot more high school workers. But I think we need a lot of low school workers too. We need them in ag and we need them in domestic situations. And one of the dimensions in the comprehensive reform bill is they're going to have a, a commission it's going to, for the first time, it's going to attract labor needs. We actually don't plan labor in this. We're a laissez-faire capitalist nation, and labor happens to show up. <laughs> it has happened to show up illegally because we didn't allow it. That was a safety valve. Well, now we're going to plan it. We're going to plan our labor needs, and that's something that a lot of people don't want to do. They don't want to have a planned economy, but you sort of can't regulate and, and choke off the economy. You've got to actually make sure you have enough and it includes low and high skilled. I like that. I think it's, let's track it. Let's see how many we really do need. And don't, don't forget the, the low skill, too. So, so I'm all for that. But, but, but what sorts of implications do you think that has for the housing market? Well, um, more people is better for the housing market. <laughs> uh, we have a, a really suffering a, a, a downturn in, in the growth of the, in household formations. It's been sustained. And we have an enormous number of potential sellers and exiters in the housing market in the next 20 years. We have to start cultivating the replacements for them. I want to plan the housing market to that extent. Anything we can foresee this reliably, we are utter fools if we don't take advantage of it. We, we know people do get older. We know the baby boomers get older. And we know there's going to be massive vacancies. If we don't plan for that, we are irresponsible. We have to think ahead. And immigrants are not the whole solution. I testified at Ellis Island. Day. I got to go to Ellis Island and testify before Congress about immigration. And I, I'm still on that, still maintaining that testimony I haven't made, that immigrants can only solve a quarter of the problem for the aging boomers. But it's a valuable quarter. The other quarter, roughly, comes from raising taxes, cutting benefits, uh, growing the deficit, all these things you don't want to do. So, you know, you really should take advantage of that one quarter that's the easiest, I think, and has other side benefits. Um, and, and I'll admit 
to a, a social policy concern I have, too, about admitting high school immigrants. I think that the average uh, voter in America, mother and father, would rather have their own children get those jobs, rather than think about bringing in importing newcomers as a first resort. That should be a last resort. We really should cultivate our own children for the high school jobs. And I, I just would hate that the worst scenario possible is to import high school workers and neglect large swaths of our, of our youth that we don't ever cultivate and develop. Because for whatever reason, we, we just neglect them, as we have been doing. That is a polarization strategy that I do not support. So at first, we absorb, we do the most for the young people we have and absorb them in the labor market at the highest skills possible for them, and then we fill the needs with immigration. That would be the, the wisest social policy for America. I, ha I, I have a question. I, I don't know how this uh, connects with your story, but there's a lot of discussion about uh, global cities and uh, cities where housing values and housing and, uh, are not just driven by internal forces, but you know, like LA, New York, London, Miami, London. and it tends to coincide where the the immigrant growth of ownership in its uh, so how do you see that fitting into the story? You well, it's, it's actually a little bit more. In London, the problem there is uh, people who buy property but don't live there. So yeah. they, these are like foreign investors who have a, they're parking a lot of their wealth in the, the, the Paris or London, in the elite cities, and, and, and don't even benefit local people. So that's, you know, that, that's added to that. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, and, you know, Vancouver had that with Hong Kong refugees brought money to, to Vancouver, and, and the housing prices went sky high, and all the Canadians had to pay high prices. So that's that is that's that's a, a problem. I, um, I I would much rather generate housing demand out of our own youth. So in immigrants and boomers, I actually segue to a discussion about how to cultivate the second generation, the children of immigrants. They're the ones who really should rely upon the most. Before we look for a, a quick fix from outside, it just seems healthier to grow our demand organically from within than to import um, you know, high spenders from abroad who can distort local markets. Or else just move out of London, and which people have done. You know, the, the, the center of London is going to become the reservation for um, foreigners who are investors. And that, that could happen in Paris. I don't know how to solve that one. No, I guess I was also getting to you, you, you tell a very homogeneous, I maybe mean, because it comes from the average, the U.S. average, but the regional variation in some of the stress is very, very pronounced. And, and uh, okay. you know, so may, uh, maybe it connects with these, these different housing markets. Yeah, well, okay, so just in California, we have a lot of variety. I mean, Silicon Valley is a, is a planet to itself, totally unique. I'm actually supposed to be doing a uh, projection right now. We've, we've been trying for two years of Santa Clara County. And the migration patterns, everything are just totally different. We've had to, it's just, it's, it's not, it's, you think it'd be simple to do, and it's really the most complicated place because everything's happening from abroad at high levels. Um, and then in Southern California, we have Inland Empire areas, which are really depressed, and we have the coastal area, which is, and it's, it really does vary. Uh, the common denominator is baby boomers. They're, they're really cut across all locations. They're in everywhere. They're in Silicon Valley. They're in Inland Empire. They're on the coast. And so it, that's a starting place to kind of figure things out. Um, I, I think you know you need to have a range of housing types and housing expenses for all the people in your region. You have to have workforce housing for school teachers and police officers and other workers. You need to have executive housing for some people. So I think we, we really need to keep track of all those. So they, that they will find their way in a hierarchy. And the people at the top dollar, they, they go first. They choose what they want, and they choose the high ground, they choose by the coast. And then the rest of us sort of come later, and we sort of triple our way inland away from the amenities. And that's, you know, that's, that's how capitalism sorts out demand. Um, if we had immigrants, uh, they, they by and large been coming at the bottom with the exception of Asian immigrants, who bring a lot of wealth with them. And, and there it creates an interesting paradox. 
Some people say that Asians are more assimilated and more successful immigrants than Latinos are because they show up with high education and they have living expensive houses and they have high home ownership, and so they must be more successfully assimilated. And yet that's not really the meaning of assimilation. Assimilation is a gradual accommodation over time, adaptation over time. And, and ironically, the Latino immigrants look more like the traditional European immigrants of working their way steadily up the ladder over 30 years. They move into the existing shell of a building and they sort of put a new sign on it and they revitalize that storefront. Asians move in and they tear down the building and build a new one that looks like, reflects their cultural preference from where they just came from. And then they have signs on it and it's it, it sort of a strictly you know, Chinese clientele. And it revitalizes the neighborhood, but it, it's kind of remaking the landscape because they have the capital to do that. It's not really assimilation, it's, it's like a colony of, of uh, Shanghai. In, we have places with a great mall of uh, China, it's called, in, uh, in, on San Gabriel Boulevard, uh, I mean, Valley Boulevard, in, uh, near San Gabriel Boulevard, in, uh, in uh, San Gabriel, city of San Gabriel. And so it's, it, it's interesting, that, that, that the contradiction here, that, and I, I, you know, the slow and steady way is more, it's easier to incorporate for the, um, the existing population because it, they don't lose their landmarks and, and it, you know, they, it's not, they don't feel like it's being bulldozed. Uh, and yet it takes longer and uh, it's more gradual, but it's more traditional. So when people arrive with lots of wealth, they can do what they want in America. And that's threatening sometimes for people. But it's a really a contradiction between different types of immigrants who settle in different parts of the, of the city. I hate to curve the conversation, but it is 1.30. Um, and so uh, those of you who want to continue to, uh, to chat, uh, now we'll be here about one of Thank you for uh, coming, and thank you, Penny, for this very stimulating talk. And uh, again, I uh, um, uh, go to our website. You can get the list of upcoming events. Next, next uh, Friday at noon, in this room, we'll have Michael Jones Correa uh, from Cornell speaking on uh, immigrants, uh, diversity, incorporation, uh, and civic engagement with, uh, 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 from a long-term research project he's doing in involves Philadelphia. Thank you. I hope you've helped any remaining food. And if you're not already on our mailing list, we find out. Excuse me.